Welcome everyone. This is session IC96 entitled Seating and Positioning Across the Continuum, Improving Outcomes. My name is Julie and I'll be the moderator for today's session. And I will provide the CEU code at the end of the session. Before we get started, please make sure to mute yourself. And if you have any questions, they can be posted in the chat. Um, our speakers today are Stephanie Cooley and Matthew Linsenmeyer. And I will go ahead and turn it over to them for your session. Good morning, guys. Thank you for joining us here on the home stretch. Um, yeah, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm an occupational therapist, and I work in, at OSU in our inpatient rehab hospital, which is called Dodd, Dodd Hall. Um, and I work in our seating clinic in the inpatient setting as well. And my name is Matt Linsmeyer. I'm a PT. I've been working here on the outpatient side at our assistive technology center for going on uh, seven years now. Um, so hopefully this gives you some insight about how we kind of cross paths and kind of transition patients from the inpatient side over the outpatient side. Um, so these are just the objectives uh, for today. Hopefully you'll be able to list three successful strategies for collaboration through the continuum, um, be able to list three barriers contributing to decreased follow through, and be able to name uh, two ways of tracking patient follow up and follow through. So this is just a schematic kind of uh, to give you a reference of how we are doing things at OSU. Uh, so Again, I'm in that kind of big middle square at Dodd Hall. So we get patients from the acute care hospital. Very rarely we'll get them from SNFs um, and even um, rarer than that, sometimes we get them straight from home. Uh, but since it is an inpatient rehab hospital, they have to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy. Uh, so not all patients that um, come from the acute care hospital are appropriate for Dodd. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that as well. And then if they do go through our seating clinic at Dodd, then we will refer them to our AT center or our outpatient seating clinic at OSU. Um, that's always our recommendation. Now we do have lots of patients that are from more rural areas. So since we're in Columbus in the city, it's hard for them to come back in. So some people up front will say, I cannot come back in for follow up. So we will um, have the vendors uh, do the fittings at home. And then we have the clients, of course, that we recommend that they follow up at the AT center. They say, oh, that sounds great. And then when it comes time for delivery, they're like, nope, I'm not driving back to Columbus. That's a two hour drive, a three hour drive. And so then we have to also do the final fittings at home. And then we have do have a lot of patients that actually do follow up at our AT center. Um, and even if that's all they're coming in for, that's sometimes how we can convince them to come back to Columbus because it's you know one-time thing and then maybe some follow-ups, but really to help them get the best fit with their chair and understand that um, that's why we are recommending it. Uh, so we just wanted to highlight at um, OSU, we do have different tools that we use to try to show our patients the importance of following up at the AT Center. So uh, one of those is our outpatient tours. So once a month, we take um, patients. We used to be able to take up to four patients. Now we can only take two at a time just because of COVID and not having our own transportation. So we have to use kind of the OSU system transportation. Um, but we take them over for a tour of the outpatient facility. And also, um, since most of you are, aren't familiar with OSU, uh, we are separated. So. Yes, we're one campus, but we're a giant campus, so we can't walk or roll back and forth between the two hospitals. So um, we have to take transportation to the outpatient, but this way they can see not only um, what their OT and PT would look like if they went to our outpatient, but they can also see the, the AT center. And it's really, I think, nice for them to see not only the equipment and the different devices and why we want them to go there from that perspective, but also see the staff. and how they interact with them and how oftentimes we'll see vendors that the patient has already met with at Dodd, we'll see them at um, the outpatient center and they can say, oh, you know, there's my vendor that I'm gonna follow up with and make them feel a little bit more comfortable with the idea of coming all the way back to our outpatient for their follow-up appointment. Uh, so going back to kind of that first schematic, 
um, most of our patients are starting out in the acute care setting. So I don't work in acute care. I float over to acute care sometimes. So I do have some experience and I've done some seating evals in acute care when patients weren't appropriate for Dodd to do the three hours. But in acute care, they're doing their normal uh, PT and OT evaluations. And they're also kind of starting that initial education. I think that's the most important key, especially if they're not coming to Dodd is that they're getting that education about why it's important for them to follow up at the outpatient seating clinic or with their vendors to get appropriate equipment. And then they're also making appropriate referrals. So if they do need to go to the seating clinic and they're not coming to Dodd, making sure they get the referrals in for them to go to our outpatient seating clinics so that they don't get missed in the system. And then where I work in inpatient rehab, they again would get a PT and OT evaluation um, another criteria for inpatient rehab is they have to get at least two of the three therapies. So PT and OT, and then possibly speech. So they're evaluated by at least PT and OT. And then at the OT evaluation, the occupational therapist is screening for seating needs. So if they have a need for a custom wheelchair or a long-term seating need, then they would come through our inpatient wheelchair clinic. And that's where you have myself as an OT, and then we have a PT um, who works in our wheelchair clinic as well. So one of the two of us would see them and do the same thing. So meeting with suppliers, trialing equipment, um, educating the patient on how wheel the whole wheelchair process works, and giving appropriate referrals to if there isn't something we didn't complete or anything like that, that they would follow up with the appropriate person. So a big... Um, Part of this presentation, and I think that's important, is kind of showing these differences between our inpatient and outpatient clinic. Um, so therapist roles. So like I said, there's only two therapists on the inpatient side that do seating. And our roles are different in the fact that we have our normal OT, PT roles throughout the day. So I'm working on ADLs, um, IADLs, strengthening throughout the, the day, and then also doing seating clinic throughout the day. So my day is split, and so is the physical therapist that works with me. And then um, direct support is limited for our inpatient. So we don't have um, vendors or suppliers on site. So at our outpatient clinic, the vendors are there most of the day. Now, again, we're fairly close. So if we have a need, we can usually call our vendors and get it um, met during that day. So it's not that big of a barrier, but it is a big difference as I can't just grab a vendor to help me fix a chair. We have our own um, rehab aid that helps with that. Um, and also on the direct support limited is um, we don't have our own manager for wheelchair clinics. So all the, um, uh, if we need anything, we have a manager that manages in rehab, but sometimes they don't understand the complexities of uh, issues we might have specific to seating and positioning. Um, another benefit that we have is we have more time with our patients. So they can try out the wheelchairs for weeks at a time because our average length of stay is two weeks. Most of our patients, especially spinal cord patients, can stay you know, up to four. And so they have time to try out this different equipment, get direct feedback. They also can use the, the equipment throughout the day. So um, it's not just in the morning when they have lots of energy that they can use the equipment, they can also use it in the evening. So I get feedback from nursing. Uh, for example, if a patient is safe with me with a power chair, but then they get really fatigued in the evening and I get a lot of feedback from nursing that they're running into things or that kind of stuff. So it's really nice to get a ton of feedback on the equipment. Um, another benefit is we have smaller caseloads. So we are um, a 60 bed hospital, so we can only have so many patients. And then of those patients, only a certain amount have seating needs. So it's kind of a contained environment. Um, I already spoke to the longer equipment trials. Um, I think one of the barriers for us is um, a lot of our patients have newer injuries, so they're still dealing with adjustment. Um, so I have a handful of patients that aren't ready to decide. Um, or they want power, but they're not safe with power yet because they haven't had enough practice or time to heal. So this is where having that ability to refer to outpatient is a huge benefit. Because if they're not ready, instead of sending them home with nothing, I can still set them up with a vendor, set them up with an appointment outpatient so that they can get their needs met when they're ready and not have to rush things or force something on them that they're not ready for. Um, something that I learned in making this presentation with Matt is that our billing is different. 
Um, so an inpatient, I just click a button for wheelchair skills and training and someone in the, you know, epic universe takes care of that for me. Whereas um, an outpatient, they have to, you know, bill certain things that I don't understand. So uh, I don't have to worry about that, which is nice. Um, we have a captured audience, so there's no transportation barriers. So the patient is here. I can go to their room if they're not feeling well and meet them in, in their bed. I can, um, you know, rearrange things for when they get back from an appointment. So a lot more um, flexibility there. And then another difference is at our inpatient hospital, we have multiple doctors that we work with. So on each service, uh, spinal cord, stroke, brain injury, we have different doctors that I have to kind of know their nuances and how they want documentation completed so that I can get it <laughs> completed on time. Um, whereas outpatient, they have one referring doctor. So I think it's just a different dynamic. Not, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other, but just a different dynamic. So once somebody does get um, discharged and the ideal situation happens, um, I, I do want to touch base quickly on our AT center um, is, I want to say, a little bit more robust um, than maybe other centers might be. Uh, just to give you some perspective, we, all the therapists here in our AT center clinic, this is our focus. Um, we do not split time with maybe outpatient rehab or different kind of things. Everything is housed within the AT center. So this is where I live, I'm going to call it. Um, there are four other PTs that join me in the seating side. There are three OTs that join me in the seating side. Um, one does split a little bit of time with our driving, our adaptive driving program that also has three other OTs. And then we do have a speech therapist here in clinic every single day. Um, that is before you include uh, Teresa Berner and uh, Dr. Carmen DeJovene in kind of our big wild world. And then we also have two fantastic front desk staff. Um, I, I think the big thing to consider there is there's a lot of people that go into all of this happening. And even though this process is always evolving and moving forward, we absolutely understand that we have a lot of resources that we're able to tap into and utilize and leverage that um, aren't always there, but this didn't happen overnight. Um, Stephanie can attest to that. She has been a part of kind of growing this relationship and this feedback loop so I, I do think that it is important to realize that the setup that we have is attainable. It is something that can be done. It does take a lot of work and it does take a lot of passion. Um, I do have to plug um, Kathy Carver and Katie Fitzgerald down from UAB. They did a fantastic presentation. I believe it's IC66. Um, it, it's almost looking at their, they feel the pains and they feel some of the things that we've worked through but I will absolutely say that we still have pains and we're still working through a lot of things. Um, so this first slide that I'm gonna talk about, this is if a person has come to us for a final fitting. So things were decided at inpatient clinic with Stephanie and whatever vendor they worked with. And they say, hey, we see the value, we understand what you can offer us. They come to us for a final fitting. Um, we definitely think that this allows for some consistency, but also kind of capturing that audience kind of like Steph said, is we can show them our value right away by getting hands-on, by showing who our faces, by moving through some of those adjustments and making them understand what we can kind of provide. Another thing that kind of will pull a lot of those people in and help us a lot is um, we are technically on the third floor, our second floor outpatient rehab. Um, a lot of these patients follow up there for continued OT and PT or speech needs. So we're able to kind of capture them. You're here, come get your equipment here, follow up with us. So it's a really nice way to just grab these people and automatically fold them into the outpatient side. Um, we're able to talk about these modifications. So Stephanie might have a client, and this has happened multiple times when a high level spinal cord injury, they are most appropriate for power maybe right away, just because there's a lot coming at them. Maybe there's not a lot of time to spend on a manual style or a power assist or something of that nature. And they get to me three months later and they've started seeing other people in rehab. And they're like, hey, outpatient rehab, there's a lot of manual chairs down there. My therapists have brought this up. What can we do? So it's kind of showing that we can work in through that process and keep things moving along in a nice stream. And we can offer all those things right here in a place that they're comfortable with. 
Um, the other major thing that I do want to touch base on and Stephanie kind of brought into the fold is our vendor support. Um, we do have a system here where not only do we have our ATPs live in every single appointment that we have for continued follow-up, but we are also very fortunate to have um, the support of these vendors to provide what we're going to call clinical liaisons. So that is a secondary person that is physically here in clinic that can help provide communication, that can be another face that we can say, if you cannot get a hold of your ATP because maybe they're in a session or maybe they're jumping between us and Dodd Hall, here's the person, here's a live person you can talk to that can help coordinate everything. Obviously, that is taken away massive amounts of headaches for us. And we see that as such a valuable tool because we're able to get in-time communication right there and everybody is a part of the conversation. Um, lastly, from this kind of set, set up and walk through is the education that we're able to provide. Again, being face-to-face, -face, you're able to touch base, you're able to make sure everybody's on the same page and we're able to do maybe further wheelchair skills we're able to look and say, hey, we need to optimize this in this form or fashion. So how can we best set up this experience so that the patient sees our value and buys into that value and wants to continue that value? The op other option that I wanna say is if an order has been deferred from outpatient clinic. So Stephanie, the ATP, the client themselves are just saying, hey, I'm not ready yet, or we're seeing X, Y, Z, and we maybe need to get some more information or we need to get some more trials. So that is where, again, our vendor um, communication and relationship has really stepped up with providing a little bit more of a long-term loaner that hopefully is closer and is gonna give us some more information. I know that is a resource that is very difficult to come by and we're extremely fortunate with our vendors, but also our manufacturer reps um, at really helping us out even if it is not something that maybe we spec out that exact manufacturer, they see the value in getting people in the correct thing because they know long-term that is the best outcome for the patient. When a person comes that does not have a specific fitting going on and wants to try out more things before we write that prescription and I get to do all that extra paperwork, that is where we loop in um, our pm &R physician. His name is Dr. Daniel Kim. He specifically works with our wheelchair clinic. Um, that is his full caseload as well. So we are very fortunate in those regards is we have that one point of contact. We have a physician that understands our crazy documentation world and requirements, and he's able to poke and prod and bring out some ideas and truly, again, work as that whole cohesive team so that we can really establish, okay, what do we need to do? How can we educate this client? How can we make them an informed consumer so that they can try as many things as possible? How can we set up different options, different backrests, different cushions, pressure mapping? Do we wanna try this style of power access? So it allows us to kind of create this full-fledged kind of community around this patient. And it may have just come down to at a month after injury or a month and a half after injury and discharged a home that that patient just from a mental emotional standpoint isn't ready to commit to something because they're already balancing six other more important medical things, whether it's urological issues, whether it's just transportation issues, home setup issues. Can we maybe defer our stuff a little bit longer, give them some more time to think and educate themselves so that they make, can make the best decisions and we can encourage the best decisions for them. So with um, kind of this flow, what we've also started to implement is we try and capture these clients and get them established with a follow with a yearly follow checkup with Dr. Kim. Again, this is something that we want to keep in-house as much as possible. We've referred into him, you've become an established patient, come back in a year, see him, what do we need to do? Do we maybe need to look at new equipment? Do we need to maybe look at updating, getting a smaller backrest? I have so many clients that they go downstairs for a long-term rehab and they're like, hey, why is my backrest so big? At discharge, it may have been the most appropriate thing. Now they're like, Matt, I want, I see on Instagram, I see all these things, this thing's huge, I wanna do this, that, and the other thing. Great, let's do that. Let's educate you, let's try some things, but let's again make, make you an informed consumer so that when you do make these decisions, everybody's on, 
on board and understands. Um, I think also hitting some of those higher level skills trainings, it lets you get into your life. We understand that this equipment has to mesh into your life and has to work with your life and your home and your environment. So how can we best include some of that training and improve that training and make you a more efficient person throughout your life there? One of the big things that we do utilize is the functional mobility assessment. Um, that is something that technically I'm gonna say is for a new piece of equipment. However, we do like to use that no matter what and track that update so that we are understanding what is working and what is not working in a patient's life. So it may not be something that goes into our larger data set, which that is a whole different presentation, but it's something that we're still trying to track and understand so that we're helping educate in a better way and make more informed consumers out of all of our clients and patients. Um, telehealth is another thing that we kind of have access to. And much like Stephanie said, and I believe that there's been a lot of great presentations here. Um, so I'm not going to delve super deep into um, the telehealth use basis, everything like that. But I think that we do notice and we had some infrastructure in place because of some protocols going on that when COVID did hit and when the pandemic hit, we automatically just rolled into it. Um, our big thing is we always want a vendor to be a part of that appointment if possible. Mm -hmm. So again, that's where our vendors have been very generous and given their time where they do go out and they do are a part of that in the home setting. That it allows us to take away some of the technology potentially issues because we are asking the vendor to come with any technology. So their phone, their computer, it's not something else that the client has to worry about. Also, um, we do have to consider the kind of funding of that and that consideration. Um, again, that is a whole different major presentation that we can go down a whole rabbit hole. But we do have to, from the outpatient side, really understand what we can offer clients again, making sure that they understand all of their options and even laying out, hey, maybe this isn't a fundable option, but what can we do to su support you as much as possible? And how can we kind of get there? Um, this next slide is kind of jumbled and crazy. And this was when Stephanie and I really talked and she's like, oh my goodness gracious, Matt, what's going on? So every single one of these lines, as you kind of go down this graph, this is a single funding source or payer. So these are all things that I have to look at and know beforehand going in. Am I able to bill a wheelchair and seating code? Am I, what modifiers do I have to do? When do things expire? Do I have to use a video? Or if the video fails, can I still do more of a telephone encounter? So it's just something to consider with all of these logistics that again, we're making sure that we're educating the clients on. Positives of telehealth. Um, obviously there's the logistics of transporting a chair, a new injury, Vans don't just appear. Um, transportation services are inconsistent. We live in Ohio, we're expecting an ice storm tonight. So guess what? There's gonna be transportation companies they just have a right to refuse to come out and get you. That same day appointment, that, that leaves a lot of people stranded. So how can we again, support these clients as much as possible and give them the most benefit while also showing our benefit? If I can be there, how can I, not sell myself, but how can I show you that I am important and I want to be important and I want to be an educator in this. Um, the severity of the disease process. Obviously, we're mainly focusing more on an inpatient to outpatient basis. So something like a spinal cord injury or more of an acute injury. We do have clients here that we see obviously with more chronic disease processes or more aggressive disease processes like an ALS. So how can we make overall life easier. Maybe getting here, there's a medical fragility to consider. Maybe there's some wound considerations. Maybe there's, again, just some caregiver considerations. So how can we best help the client and make sure that we are still always a part of the process? Negatives and um, anybody that truly knows me from a day-to-day -day standpoint, I cannot stand not to be hands-on with somebody. Um, I, I, I've kind of joked with my clients during this pandemic, by the graces of our upper administration at the hospital, we were kind of exempt from having to stay away from our clients. Um, I tell people, I'm still going to touch your butt. And it's just the fact of the matter is I'm a seating clinician. So I love that hands-on because I know that I can get a lot more. Um, I have more access to tools as far as pressure mapping, as far as just body language and personal interaction. It does a lot for our clients and it gives a lot to our clients as far as what they rely on there. 
Um, and even just understanding concepts, are we able to say something and then, okay, we see that there's retention, even just going out the door down to their car and things of that nature. So it's one of those things where there, there are positives and negatives to both. Um, so back to inpatient. So again, it's uh, talking about telehealth is a lot different in inpatient because our patients are there. So we're not, telehealth isn't with them, but with families, um, with vendors, which I'll talk on. Uh, so even before COVID, we did some uh, home evaluations and assessment for equipment planning uh, via uh, telehealth or um, FaceTiming with family. Uh, so they would be able to show us kind of what the home looks like because a lot of times people aren't remembering it right or they're thinking things are different than they actually are. So being able to actually see um, what the home looks like can be helpful with uh, prescribing different equipment. Um, since COVID, we've still used it for that, um, but now we have a secure platform that we use called UpDocs. So it is HIPAA compliant. So uh, we can dial into the family to do education and involvement. So there was a time uh, where we were not allowed to have any visitors at all at an inpatient. And this was very stressful for everyone, but it seemed to especially heighten people's emo emotions around wheelchairs because family wants to be involved, but they cannot come in. Um, so I tried some over the phone, but that didn't really seem to appease people because as we know, uh, we want to be hands-on, but also wheelchairs are very visual. What is my husband sitting in? Why is that best? Can you show me how that part comes off? Can you show me how to fold the chair? So again, not being able to get hands-on, but being able to have them on a platform where they could see, interact with me and the patient at the same time is very helpful and helped kind of ease some of those tensions with family members. Um, we also recently had a, a situation where a patient had been COVID exposed. And so the staff had to wear our N95s and our gowns and all that to go in to see the patient. And um, I asked management, what do I do? They were supposed to meet with the supplier today. The supplier is not N95 fit to come into this room. And so my manager said, put them on up docs. So go into the patient's room, put my, uh, call the vendor on UpDocs, have them dial in, and so they could see the patient, talk to the patient. But again, just like Matt said, that barrier of not being able to actually see the patient in person in the chair and see it from kind of all sides and get your hands on the patient and see everything. So still a lot of limitations with, with that situation. Um, so just going into some of the research, because of course, you know, we do these things and we hope that we're doing the right thing. We see good results, but we need to, to look at the research as well. So fatigue, um, and most of our articles are about spinal cord injury. Uh, we know it's common with spinal cord injuries admitted for rehab. And what they found is that it remains stable during rehab and after discharge into the community. So they showed that we should consider early screening, which that would be our acute care therapist, right, going in screening for fatigue, um, and then an inpatient giving interventions to reduce fatigue, and then continuing an outpatient to address those issues. Um, so then this consideration can benefit from optimizing the seating system. So what can we optimize on the seating system throughout their rehab to address fatigue? So not only addressing it in acute care, but then inpatient and then following out an outpatient to see Where's your fatigue at? Where could we change the equipment or what needs to be adjusted? And then ongoing delivery of care is necessary to maximize recovery of function. Uh, so I think we all could agree with that, with that statement. So some recommendations from this research article were to standardize data element collection and facilitate database linkage. So outpatient already does that really well um, and we do it a little bit here. Um, but I think that kind of shows room for growth in our inpatient level, but also just to kind of collaborate that data collection a little bit more. Um, another recommendation was to validate and adopt more outcome measures. So hopefully from this conference, we can kind of brainstorm what other outcome measures might be beneficial for inpatient and outpatient and kind of continuing that collaboration. And then another recommendation was to increase opportunities for collaborations with our stakeholders from a diverse background. Um, and we're lucky in Columbus, we have a pretty diverse background, so that's helpful. But we, I think, can reach out more to get feedback from our patients to see how well we're doing and get their opinion. Um, and I know we've tr 
tried, attempted in inpatients uh, via um, the IHIS model to reach out to our patients. But I think in the last year, I've gotten maybe 10 responses and most of them, and they're anonymous, so I don't know, but most of them just clicked, you know, you know, their, their rating number and didn't really leave many comments. So that would be helpful um, if we could get kind of more uh, feedback from them too. Um, and then aging with a spinal cord injury. So I think this really shows like not only inpatient and outpatient, but even following with that, with that follow-up, having those yearly follow-ups that they do at outpatient to make sure as patients age that the equipment's still meeting their needs. Because, you know, this list we all know, pressure sores, UTIs, respiratory tract infections. So you guys can all read and know those. So I think that's it just Another reason why we really need to make sure these patients are following up, even if they live in more rural areas, we're saying we just need you to come in once a year, just like you would come in for your other doctor's appointments. And how could we maybe um, coordinate that better so that maybe it's on the same day as some of their other appointments so they don't have to come back to Columbus as often during the year. Um, and then the, these are just the secondary health conditions that we all know that go with spinal cord injury. So. Um, just thinking about how can our seating affect these items? So how can we help reduce pain? How can we um, help reduce spasms or pressure sores? So just thinking about that across the continuum. So I think inpatient, we're really focusing on educating and making sure they know that these are issues that can occur over time and just continuing to get that through outpatient, continuing to get that education because as we all know, the first time you hear something, you're probably not going to retain it. So repeat, 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 and that teach back is really important. Um, and then another article um, just said that secondary health conditions were higher among women and individuals with a complete lesion, tetraplegia with higher body mass index. So how are we using that information from the data to um, personalize their follow-up? So Maybe uh, if it's a female patient with a complete tetraplegia, we're not following up in a year, but we're following up in six months. So just kind of personalizing it based on the data. We know you're at higher risk, so what can we do to reduce your risk? So education is key. So I think uh, we all can agree with that. And we talked about kind of repeating the education. Um, so uh, the more that we can educate, the better. And Matt, if you want to go to the next slide. So I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the education that we use at OSU. So this is our wheelchair clinic little brochure um, specific to Dodd. And I didn't want to put all the pages because I think it's like 20 pages long. But you can see with the table of contents. So going over choosing a vendor, home eval, it's actually in there where they could write in different measurements. And I have a lot of patients that use that and write in all the measurements. So that is really helpful. Um, they have their family take it home. And um, so that's fine, that's fine, Matt. you can go to the next one. And then we also have, this is not a real video, this is just a screenshot, but to give you an idea of, um, so our patients at Dodd get me or, or our PT talking to them about all these points. They get the little brochure with all those points written because we know some people do better reading. And then they also have tablets in their room where we can upload these videos, which is basically just a video of a PowerPoint where they can watch it and it reviews those points again. So kind of giving them different ways to access the information. The other nice thing with having all this information in different formats is that family members can then access these videos. It's on Vimeo, as you can see there. So I can um, send a link to uh, patients' families. I've been doing a lot of emailing so I can attach that booklet via email and send that to families too. So they kind of are getting that same um, information as well. So jumping into one of the uh, studies from Rowan um, up in the Ontario area, I, I don't think that there's any surprise with what they found out and some of the conclusions that they came to is that when we're looking at outcome measures, there's a lot of outcome measures out there. Um, and this isn't just related to seating. This is related to nursing care, wound care, urologics. This is just, you know, psychological well-being. So what are all of these things and what are all these outcome measures and how can we use the data? And 
how are there links between the data sets and what can it kind of tell us? Um, so it just showed that there's some, there are some gaps in that linking things, but there's also some gaps in the reporting. So gathering all that information, gathering our big data and using all these data sets to help understand from a clinical side, how can we treat somebody? How can we change policy? How can we influence people? And how can we educate people? Um, but then also how can we, uh, are we failing or is there a better way to get all the stakeholders involved? So how can we push this to insurances, to policymakers to make sure that they not only understand the data sets, but understand the outcome from the data sets, that it's not just numbers, that it's actually is what is going on with actual end users, but also how can it impact further or future users that may be going through something. Um, obviously, it showed that a lot of this stuff is we're getting these data points when we have that captured audience, like Stephanie said. It's really easy when a patient's right in front of you and inpatient to gather information so that first three to six months after injuries, there's a lot of data points. There's a lot of stuff. How do we get a year out, two years out, three years out? Where are we catching things? Where are we spurning ideas in a patient's head to say, oh yeah, hey, actually this is going on. And that made me think about this, even though it's a different spot in my life, it's also impacting this and this and this. So where can we kind of, again, keep that fresh in even a consumer's mind to encourage them and to get them to give us those data points further down so we can start forming what is a best practice or how can we get there in a more efficient way for the clients? Um, and how can we just overall increase how the community-based health surveillance happens? So is it just on your seating therapist? Is it just on your PCP? Or what can we do from a community viewpoint of capturing things a little bit easier and including those in what we're seeing as increasing the outcome measures and the validity and the efficacy of those outcome measures? So uh, now kind of transitioning to how we um, follow up on information from an inpatient rehab, right? Because I put in this information, I put in this order and I send the patient on their way in their loan appointment. So I literally have no idea what, when they get their stuff, what it looks like, if I did a good job. So at discharge, the patients are entered into a panel list. So um, this is like a SharePoint list. So you have, um, this is obviously not a real person, last name, first name, physician that did the um, documentation, and then inpatient clinic. And if you um, click that, you could also do outpatient clinic. Um, so there's different ones there. Service E for eval, and then first appointment date, and then supplier, so we know who to follow up with. And then there, what they chose, if there was any issues. So like if they child power, but it was a disaster. And so we recommended manual those kinds of things, any information if the patient was difficult or if they chose a really tall backrest, even though you suggested that they didn't, you know, just to, to, to you know, let people know that sometimes the decisions we make in inpatient are not all <laughs> up to us. Um, and then the update in panel. So that would be two months from when they discharge because that hopefully is close to when they should be receiving their equipment. Um, so they're entered into this and then that update in panel date, um, once that date comes, so in March, um, during that week of March 12th, I will get an email that includes all the patients that need to be followed up upon. So um, in March, I'll get an email that has John Smith's name and I will look John Smith up in IHIS uh, and he uh, maybe pops up, oh, he's gonna see Matt on Tuesday for the fitting of his chair. So I will then send Matt an email and I'll say, hey, I see here that you're going to be seeing John on Tuesday. Um, we did his eval at Dodd. Notes in IHIS. Please let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Or that would be a great time for me to tell Matt, you know, hey, I'm really worried about this component because it's not what I think he should have had. So, you know, that kind of thing. Or, hey, he might be mad that it's a manual chair because he really wanted power, but he wasn't safe. That, that type of information. Then I will also send the vendor an email that says, has John Smith received his, his wheelchair? And so um, that kind of keeps the vendor accountable. So they know that they're gonna be following up with me in two months. So they need to know, I need to know, you know, 
if they've gotten their equipment or what the delay is or if anything else is needed. Um, and it also lets Matt know that they were seen at DOT and kind of gives him some background information before he goes to do the final fitting of the equipment. So it's very, very helpful in both instances. And of course, we have people that don't follow up at our outpatient center. And so that's where it's really important that I'm getting that information from the vendor to say, has this person received their equipment? And sometimes they'll even take pictures of the patients in their home with their equipment. So that's good feedback for me. And then on that note, if I do something, um, that maybe wasn't best practice or wasn't the best thing, that's where it's really helpful for me to get feedback from the vendors or from outpatient so that I can continue to grow as a therapist as well. Um, because without that feedback, right, I'm just gonna keep doing the same thing and um, not grow as a therapist and not do best practice for my patients. Um, so I think the number one thing I want to uh, bring up about what, what we refer to as this panel, um, it's, a, it, it's a glorified spreadsheet, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Um, I, I, this is basically our, I'm going to call our heartbeat of everything. This is where we can track our patients. This is where we understand what's going on with our patients. Um, and it, it gives everyone. So Stephanie has access to, I'm going to say our outpatient panel. I have access to her inpatient panel. Um, it, it just allows us to make sure that we're not letting somebody fall through the crack. And how this is set up um, definitely is something that helps create that communication. And it is a little bit more automated, but it's something that has to be touched. So it has to be touched by the vendors when they get an alert to give us an update. Um, it has to be touched by me when that vendor then gives us back that update. So it allows us to just kind of stay on top of the case, keep things fresh in our mind. It allows us to give kind of quick info and review of that patient to the clinician. Um, it allows us to check, okay, was paperwork put in? When was it put in? How far out are we? Is this abnormal or are we expecting things? Are we seeing maybe it's going through a certain case manager or a secondary funding source? So we expect those extended timelines. Um, it also allows very easy communication between all clinicians. Much like I said, I can jump on and one of my colleagues, Wendy, or one of my colleagues, Matt Yankee, I can say, hey, a patient called into clinic, they're upset, Matt or Wendy is not here today, what's going on with this case? I have a succinct place that I can go that I can look things up. Hey, we've, we've actually been trying to get a hold of you to schedule a fitting, or I understand things have been denied and we there's an appeal that has been put in. Were you aware of that? Has the vendor contacted you about that? So it allows all of us to kind of get this information in a quick one kind of spot. Now, I would be the very first to say that we currently are scheduling a meeting to kind of reconnect from an outpatient standpoint on how we are using, what information is in there, and even time points that we're touching or utilizing the database. So it is very much a fluid thing that can work in a lot of different ways. And I have seen a, the number on my little chat bubble way, way up here on my screen going up. So I do wanna make sure that we touch base on any questions that you have about this. Um, but again, I, I do think that this has been our heartbeat. And again, going back to um, Kathy and Katie's presentation, uh, you know, this is how they're catching things. This is how they're checking in on things. So there's, this isn't something magical. This is something that we've worked on and we've developed and it allows us a good way to even just go back and say, hey, ooh, I did that fitting. I need to connect with Steph and this is what I saw. Most of the time I'm saying, hey, Steph, things look great. This is awesome. I didn't do anything. I looked really good. You made me look really good here. But it reminds me that I do need to connect back. I need to make sure that she knows what she is doing is supporting the patient is a good outcome. And she's not just left there with, uh, I don't know what happened. So just a couple um, kind of meetings that we have across the continuum. Uh, at OSU, we have things called continuum meetings. So I'm gonna focus on the spinal cord one just because that's the one that I'm a part of. Um, so these are every other month meetings. And um, during the meetings, we talk about patient updates and transfer of care. So like 
if we had a difficult patient or a case we want to talk on, we talk about that. And that's just on a general spinal cord injury um, uh, continuum meeting. But what we've also done within the last year is now we've looped in someone from the AT center as a part of those spinal cord continuum meetings because before it was just like the spinal cord OTs and PTs down on the second floor as Matt talked about. But now we have also a representative from the outpatient AT center a part of that. So we can kind of talk about any issues we're having from a seating clinic perspective during those meetings. And then another thing that we do is AT Grand Rounds. So um, we have monthly presentations. So Matt and I did this presentation at our January one. So that's just some, give you an example, just kind of like a um, transfer of ideas, transfer of information and collaboration. And then we also have monthly product and services. So we might, you know, have a permobile in service or a quantum in service, but every month we're getting updated information from our manufacturers on different products that are coming out or new or just refreshed on products that we use a lot. So it's very helpful to kind of keep us fresh. And also, again, that collaboration, because we're, even though we're doing it, um, you know, being an online meeting like this, it's still a great way to collaborate and transfer ideas. Um, and to tack on really quick there, uh, one of the things with our grand round presentations is we do encourage and we invite manufacturers, we invite the vendors, we want a lot of people in active participation in those. Um, this is not just meant to be a sealed off thing is we want to spread information. Um, so that is even something where the, it is an open door. It's not a closed door thing by any means. Um, so if that's something that anybody would be interested in, please reach out. I would definitely make sure that you're on whatever list. Um, they're an hour at the same time every single month. So just to at least plant that seed as well. Um, so from here, the next steps as far as kind of our process is how do we address patients that don't follow up? Um, so how can we capture them or how can we influence their understanding of what we can provide? Um, and how are we leveraging all of the components? So how is maybe a vendor scripting something that's delivering the chair because they have to be there physically to deliver the chair. Um, that is something that we kind of push and require. Uh, so how, what, what are they doing to help the process? Transportation. Um, I, I don't think anybody here is under the illusion that that's not a major hurdle for our whole industry, especially for somebody that has a more of a novel injury. So how can we how can we impact that? How can we give education? How can we help support or say, hey, maybe, yes, we can still do the fitting here. The vendor is going to get the equipment home. I just need you here. You get here. I will take care of the rest of the logistics. So how can we, again, educate them that we can help and support them? Um, telehealth, how can we utilize and demonstrate our positive influence? So if I am just over a video, how can I get you to buy in and say, hey, you know, that Matt guy is not so horrible. Maybe I do need to go in and see him. Maybe we are having a denial issue, or maybe we are having an equipment issue. So doing things over the phone is not the best idea. Um, and I do want to touch base, um, Dr. DeCiano in the keynote um, address um, after Barry and Kendra on Monday morning. I think one of the biggest barriers that even we encounter now um, as a clinic is kind of crossing those state lines. I know that's up, opening up Pandora's box for some other potential issues, but I've literally gotten on the phone with somebody and they're like, I'm in Florida or I'm in Texas. And I'm like, because of the way that I'm restricted right now by your funding, this is, this is where I have to stop. Let me know when you're back in the state. And that stinks to say that because I know that that's a missed opportunity of a captive audience. Um, and outcome measures. Obviously, how can we prove our value um, without it just being extra noise kind of in the background? Um, and how can we make sure that those outcome measures and the data sets, they're also serving us. So how am I communicating back to Stephanie? Even if it's not a standardized score, what, what am I giving as far as feedback back up the chain from the initial starting point since I'm a little bit further down the chain just because of the way that the process works? So real quick, uh, a case study. So this was a 33-year-old female and she had diffuse midline glioma causing tetraplegia and she was an acute care patient. She was in our cancer hospital and she was not appropriate for inpatient rehab. I don't think she had been out of bed in months um, and she definitely couldn't tolerate three hours of therapy a day. So they were getting ready to discharge her home and they had me come over to do an eval for seating. And so I went over and um, we got the patient up in a tilt and space provided by the vendor, a loaner uh, tilt and space for her to go home with. And we met virtually with the vendor. So, you know, he's 
there virtually, we're with the patient taking measurements, um, giving all the information to the vendor on what we wanna order. And then she did just discharge home with that loaner chair. And then when I went to follow up, so I put her in our uh, SharePoint, just like I would a patient that was at Dodd. Um, so um, she did the, declined, declined the OSU delivery just because her mom could not get her there in the Tilton space. So they delivered to her home. Um, they took pictures and gave me the feedback of no issues with delivery or fit. So, you know, that's a good example of how we still got feedback, not ideal. Obviously, we would love to have had the opportunity to have her be transported in to, to see our patients and our therapists in our outpatient clinic, but just an example. And then the next slide has a couple pictures. They're not great because she has the um, sling behind her, but kind of of that. And then I think Matt had a real quick case study too. Um, I'm actually gonna defer this case study um, just because I think that there's a lot of great questions in the chat. And I know that we're kind of right at that 10 minute mark. Um, I do see that um, our manager from the outpatient's perspective, um, Teresa has been in there and kind of helping answer some questions. Um, but I do wanna make sure that we kind of touch some of those things. Um, I think one of the, uh, Kathy, to speak to the demo chair fleets, um, we do have separate ones for inpatient and outpatient. I think that I know in your um, presentation, you said that sometimes you had to juggle them a little bit. Again, we are extremely fortunate. And I think some of the manufacturers, just because of our um, the size, especially of our outpatient clinic, they've been very, very, very generous with us um, as far as providing some of these things. Um, and letting things live here so that we can give the patients as much trial as possible. Um, just so that somebody walks in the door, we're kind of good to go there. Um, Steph, um, there was one about a smaller caseload. So how many oh, people yeah. are in the caseload? I think that's a great question. That so I, I have between two and four patients, I'll say on my OT caseload. So, and those patients are usually seen um, 90 minutes a day. And then I usually have on my wheelchair caseload, I don't always see those patients every day for like an official treatment, but I would say I usually have around uh, five to 10 patients that are on my wheelchair caseload. But again, I'm not seeing those patients every day. They're just kind of like in my um, mind of I'm meeting with them, doing mat evals, you know, checking in with their therapist to make sure the equipment that they're trialing is working. So um, not huge, but it is kind of a lot. I think that what's really difficult in our setting is that I think it's hard for the other therapists that don't do seating to understand what it is to juggle not only just my own caseload and all the documentation that that in includes, but wheelchairs, making sure, you know, if something gets broken, we've gotten a little bit better, but people usually come straight to me and I'm maybe, you know, working with another patient doing something and they need their wheelchair fixed. So it's again, kind of having a little bit less support of, I don't have a whole lot of um, people that I can pass things to, but um, yeah, so two to four um, regular OT patients and then five to 10 in wheelchair clinic. Um, one of the things that I think Teresa did touch base off of that I do wanna make sure um, that I'm kind of answering is there's some questions about face-to-face -face notes and like templates that we utilize Epic. Um, here at Ohio State, we call Epic IHIS, but it is the Epic system. Um, again, with Dr. Kim, he is, we're, this is a resource that is invaluable to us because he knows the wheelchair world. He knows the complex, you know, CRT stuff. Um, so we have experimented, and this has been something that Teresa has spent a lot of time on and getting pushed with, um, we do have templates. Our doc, our singular doc now um, really has built something that allows him to move efficiently through an eval, but appropriately through an eval. And then coming back to like an addendum part, what we actually do is if he does have to go back and addend, maybe a recommendation is we're providing all of those things. And I know that this is something that Teresa spent a lot of time on um, making sure that it meets Medicare guidelines or Medicaid guidelines of, okay, here's the original version. There's a timestamp. There's a signature on this second version, and this is the one. So there's an order. Um, while we 
have found that that was previously an issue, I think that that's helped prevent having to do a brand new face-to-face -face when it truly is, I'm going to call it a clerical issue that we've been able to sort some of that stuff out and we've been able to push back without having to, the logistics of bringing some, somebody back in. Um, I know that Teresa answered some questions about the FMA. Um, there is one about handing off evals from inpatient to outpatient for fitting and if changes are needed. I do want to definitely say that as much as possible, I try to communicate back to Stephanie. Um, I will be the first to admit that I am not always proficient at that or efficient. Uh, however, that is something where getting that referral to our outpatient clinic really helps because if there is something and we say, hey, well, this is really far off. This is not just changing X. We need to rethink this. Having Dr. Kim right there, we just automatically start the process. So we get that face-to-face. -face. We have the vendor there with us. We're basically starting, I'm going to say, a mods order or an eval order right then and there. So we are trying to make that efficient for the client. Um, hopefully at places, you know, can that coincide with a time that do, they're doing a follow-up with their PM and R doc or their physiatrist, you know, can we put that bug in their ear? Hey, can you go back and put this? Or if we're seeing them the same day, I'm going to send you some tidbits. Don't close your note yet. I know that's, that's not always feasible, but how can we communicate with the whole team and try and make our lives a little bit easier by doing a little more front end work? Um, Let's see. The last thing I think on here, um, I don't see anything crazy to do this. I know that there's some questions about um, panel and I believe that Teresa jumped on there and kind of answered hopefully some of those. So please feel free to email if you do have any further questions. Um, again, I, I do wanna stress that it is a, it's always a work in progress as long as we've had it established it's been something that we continue to work on and change and adjust how we utilize it. Um, so that it is a growing thing and it, we've, we've built it to work how our system works. So just because we use it one way, don't think that that is the way that a clinician or a certain place has to use it. That's for sure. Um, and I think Stephanie can kind of agree with that is we've really grown how we've hopefully communicated utilizing panel as that kind of cue and where's one good succinct place to have all that information that we can share back and forth just because our time and our days and even our just hours of operation don't always mesh up um, with kind of everything. Yeah, I think another um, nice thing with, um, with the EPIC system at least is that uh, I've had a few therapists that send me like their final fitting note and then they can also write a separate message like to me connected to that about Hey, everything looked great. Here's a couple changes we made. Boom. And I can kind of see what they're doing. Cause I don't do, I've done a handful of final fittings when people just happen to be back at Dodd and we're discharging home that I could do in the hospital. Um, but it's so rare that um, it's nice to kind of see what that process looks like. So if I do have to do it, I'm also doing it appropriately because I don't do it very often. Um, and one more question came in from um, Mackenzie kind of about, you know, if there's not an outpatient clinic, um, I, I think that's where you need to, and what I'm going to suggest, and this is where we have a great relationship with our vendors, but that's because we've pushed, um, we've, we've been, we've been firm that, hey, this is how we need to work together. If you identify something that's going on, you need to take that role and that responsibility to say, hey, let's, let's communicate. And that feedback should come not only from me as a clinician on the outpatient side to Stephanie, but that should come from a vendor as well. So what's working, what's not working, um, and how it can best impact the end result. And are you getting that feedback about the product that you're putting your name onto? So I, I think that pushing your vendors a little bit and again, being firm, but collaborative and saying, I need this information. How can we build something that triggers this? How can we build something that gives us that kind of automated update? And that's what we use panel for a lot. But how does it also hold everybody kind of responsible to what they're supposed to be doing in this process? All right, great. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to go ahead and give out the CEU code. 
It is ARR6LH, and I'm posting in the chat as well, ARR6LH. Thank you, Matt and Stephanie, for a great discussion, and go blue. Oh, come on now. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, and sorry, I should have put our emails up there further, but please reach out with any questions. We appreciate your time at this last little session before the uh, closing remark stuff. And um, please be safe if you have to travel with all the weather coming through the uh, Midwest area. Thank you, everyone.